Yeah, well, then welcome um, to my talk that I'm, I was intending to give together with uh, Daniel Wagner from uh, SUSE Software Solutions. Now, these days, unfortunately, couldn't make it here, so um, all the work is mine now. Of course, all the mistakes I'm doing are mine, too. What I'm going to discuss is two things. It's firstly a new tool, the Jitter Debugger. Does, does anyone see my laser pointer? I can barely see it. Doesn't work, yeah, so it doesn't really work. Um, the Jitter Debugger, which is a, a replacement, a drop-in replacement for the venerable cyclic test and some of the statistical considerations and statistical analysis that you can do with the new tool, especially when it comes to analyzing safety critical systems. Yeah, about me, I have uh, two roles. I work for Siemens Corporate, uh, Siemens Corporate Technology, which uh, is a company you may have heard of. We basically use Linux in a wide range of products from um, healthcare to, um, to infrastructure. Daniel Wagner, when he did the Jitter debugger work, also used to be at Siemens. Uh, these days, he switched to SUSE Linux in Germany. I'll be discussing three things. The first is some uh, generic general remarks about uh, measuring real-time systems. The second part is about Jitter debugger, how it differs from cyclic test, what you can do with it, what was our intention when we developed the new tool, and the third part is going to be some analysis examples of what you can actually do, what we think you couldn't do before as well. So why, why do we actually measure real-time systems? It's um, basically everyone, everyone in the room, I guess, knows the reasons. Is, uh, is anyone not actively involved with uh, real-time systems here? Okay, so the majority is. Basically, the reason why, uh, why we need measurement-based approaches for um, Linux-based real-time systems is uh, when you think of traditional real-time systems, you, of course, uh, run these on very, very simple processes and very simple systems where you can do a cycle-accurate uh, analysis. You can count how many instructions you need to execute a given sequence produced by the compiler and then can make quite precise estimates of how long a certain operation will, um, uh, will uh, need to, to, to execute. That's, of course, impossible with modern CPUs that do out-of-order execution, that have caches, that have translation look-aside buffers, and so on on the one hand, and, then, and uh, that run complex operating systems like Linux on the other hand, uh, where basically so many things can happen simultaneously, can, uh, can interact in very many ways that it's basically completely hopeless to come up with analytical, um, precise measurements of how long uh, a given task will take. Nonetheless, uh, Linux is being deployed in more and more real-time critical scenarios, and what's more important for us in a safety critical scenarios where the functionality of the system really matters much more than on the average uh, mobile phone, on the average desktop computer where things can really start to hurt when they go wrong and where you would like to have some, some extra assurance that um, stuff works as expected. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's a thing we can only do by properly measuring the systems and by statistically, by stochastically making sure that um, at least with a given, amount, with a given uh, level of confidence, systems work as we expect them to work. Additionally, we need to distinguish two different modes of uh, analyzing real-time systems by measurements. One is debugging and development, of course, when you build new systems, when you integrate devices, when you, when you uh, deploy new device drivers uh, on your appliances. Um, everyone knows that a lot of debugging uh, is required, a lot of improvement is required before you can ship products to the field um, to eliminate the worst um, possible bugs like um, making sure that locking is correct, that you don't get any excessive um, latencies from locking, that you detect any abuses of system functionality like, uh, for instance, engineers like to open up TCP connections in real-time context with the um, obvious results, that you eliminate all these kinds of obvious bugs and mistakes that can go into your system that cause the really heavy latencies. Uh, sometimes we, we talk about seconds and even more. That's one um, um, possible, uh, one use case for uh, measuring systems that I'm not so interested in in this talk. Um, the um, uh, scenario I'm interested in is that you have a system that basically has already seen lots of love that works as expected to work when you ship it and that contains no 
obvious bugs, so no things that, that are obviously totally off. Um, still, we want to make sure that the systems do work as expected all the time, that there's also no minor variations um, in their behavior, so we want to characterize their behavior um, in unknown environments, in field deployments. We want to compare the behavior of systems after we've done minor updates, say we are updating from kernel 4.x.y to 4.x.y plus 1 and want to make sure that things still work as we intended them to work by comparing the behavior of systems uh, with reference distributions. And one, uh, one use case that's gaining more and more traction is uh, to satisfy certain um, certifications to satisfy criteria for certain safety certifications that require um, a specific understanding of systems. For instance, uh, car manufacturers have recently become interested in deploying um, Linux in some aspects of their car control, and that requires them to satisfy certain, certain um, yeah, standards like ACL, automotive SIL, and so on that can be satisfied or that, that can be fulfilled by properly measuring systems and by proving by measurements that systems uh, work as expected. So that's the portion I'm going to focus on. And actually measuring the latencies, measuring maximum latencies of systems is quite simple. We've been doing that for ages. We've had the venerable cyclic test tool. Basically, uh, it... Um, sets up a timer, knows when the timer is supposed to expire, then measures when the timer actually expires, very roughly speaking, and then compares the expected expiration time, expiration time with the actually observed expiration time. And from the difference, you can see um, how much overhead, how much uncertainty the system introduces to a given workload. So why would we want a new tool? Why did uh, Daniel set out to write Jitter Debugger as a replacement? Firstly, um, Cyclic Test has been around for quite a while, so the code base, although it has been continuously maintained, is uh, not what people who are very much into data analysis, uh, big data, machine learning, and so on would expect. So it's still written in C. That's not the most friendly language to non-kernel hackers, um, as you know. Um, it has some historical, say, structure in it that make it hard to do certain changes and so on. And uh, it has grown into a tool that is actually, when you look at it in detail, quite hard to use. It has very many knobs that you can tune and switch and uh, where you can actually make things wrong. The intention with Jitter Debugger was to provide a solution that is written in languages that are digestible to these uh, young people that are coming from, uh, from academia, that are coming into industry, that has very few tunable knobs because the less you can tune, the less you can do wrong. Of course, that then uh, implies that Daniel makes all the right uh, choices, but we can trust him on that one. Uh, it's designed with post-processing in mind. So jitter uh, sorry, cyclic test is usually used. It's a run, it does a measurement, and then it gives you a result. The Jitter debugger philosophy is uh, you run it, then you record data, and then without post-processing, you cannot tell anything from the data. So we rely on post-processing, and for this post-processing, then we can use all the tools we like, especially the modern ones that people have come up with in the big data and machine learning age. A third point is that Jitter debugger also includes facilities to control the stress or the load generation. That may look like a, a minor point, but actually it causes quite a lot of practical trouble uh, when you don't run one single uh, one single load profile during a measurement, but you want to switch load profiles, you want to know what's going on when you switch between load profiles, so you need to know when the load has changed and so on. That's, of course, all doable with traditional uh, cyclic test measurements, but Jitter Debugger makes this very easy, basically at the uh, literal push of a button. And um, we're also focusing on mass deployments, so we're not just focusing on measuring one single system, we're focusing on measuring a lot of different systems with, say, the same kernel release, so think of uh, regression testing, think of parallel testing, uh, and then collecting the results on one centralized host in one central database on one central storage and doing an analysis of all the systems at the same time, comparing results and so on. 
The basic structure is very simple. We follow the classical Unix philosophy of do one thing and do that one thing well. The basic pipeline is you run Chitter Debugger. Chitter Debugger produces an output file, a binary output file for efficiency. Uh, once that file is produced, you run the Chitter Samples tool, and the Chitter Samples tool gives you some, uh, gives you data in a format that's suggestible for whatever statistical software you prefer. Of course, uh, if you prefer GNU R, that's the most reasonable choice you can make, and that's an objective statement. Um, the format we are writing out is also extremely simple. Basically, we record the CPU a trace was taken on, we record a timestamp value, and we record a latency value. That's all. Actually, um, things are a little bit harder or a little bit more involved than do one thing and do that well. Actually, JIT the debugger in the uh, useful scenarios does two things, still hopefully well. Two things is record the samples plus as I already mentioned, control the load generation, control the stress that the system is subjected to. Uh, the rest is an identical. Chitter debugger writes out a binary file. You run that through the Chitter samples tool, and that gives you output in a format for your statistical software. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of uh, thinking to come up with good formats to um, permanently store the results that we've obtained. It's, it's, um, that's also a thing that seems like a very straightforward problem, but you will come to appreciate it after you've done a measurement, uh, once you've done a measurement that you want to reanalyze in half a year's time or in a year's time, because if you don't spend, if you don't plan that well, you will never be able to, um, uh, to recapitulate what exact versions you used, what the circumstances of the measurement were, what parameter settings you had, and so on. Yeah, and the last, the last use case I already mentioned that Jitter Debugger has been designed for network um, deployments is to deploy Jitter Debugger on one or more targets, including stress generation. You s do not record the data on the device, especially for, um, for embedded devices. Think of Raspberry Pi class devices. You usually don't have a fast enough storage media and be large enough storage media to, uh, to store all the recorded data. So what we do is we send it over a network with some very simple protocols to some more capable host that then uh, does all the archiving and the post-processing. Okay, but that's, that's basically it. To summarize uh, the most important points, what Jitter Debugger is supposed to excel at is, a, uh, is at enabling a reducible and systematic approach, which is important when it comes to certification. So certification authorities want um, results to be reproducible. Say if you, uh, if you grant a car permission to enter or if you grant a car road worthiness, road legalness, I don't know what the right technical term is. So if you're allowed to drive the car on the road, then uh, certification authorities in five years' time may come up with suspicions that you've maybe tempered the engine and want to re-inspect uh, the evaluation data again, and then you better need to be able to actually do that again, and that's only possible if you've, uh, if you've followed a, a reproducible and systematic approach. Pardon me? Uh, we, we are Germans, we are honest people, we'd never do such a thing, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's one important aspect, and the other important aspect that um, is also actually, uh, is, is, may seem like a very, very uh, tiny detail, but which is also very uh, important in practice, is that we've completely decoupled the uh, measurement from any statistical processing. So, uh, cyclic test does some does uh, statistical processing. It does some binning of the data, and already that binning makes quite a lot of analysis impossible. If you don't have time resolution, uh, you cannot you cannot apply quite a large number of statistical analysis that you actually want. And uh, with time resolution, so by not just recording uh, either maximal latencies or pre. Uh, can's distributions of latencies, you can then apply a lot of uh, techniques from machine learning, from artificial intelligence, however you want to call it, from uh, classical statistics, and I'll be showing you one uh, example that we've worked particularly hard on, uh, and that 
does basically that um, that does allow to make worst case execution time estimates to perform worst case execution time measurements, not just based on a simple observer maximum latency approach, but also equips the results with a uh, credibility level. So how, how credible is the value that we've measured and especially it equips the measurements with error ranges. So how trustworthy um, is the result that we've gotten? Yeah. Before I come to specific analysis examples, let me make uh, some remarks on how to store data reproducible. I've already introduced this very simple format that we're using that, uh, that is basically child's play, but that comes from three principles that should govern all reproducible measurements. Again, this looks extremely straightforward, and it actually is extremely straightforward, but if you uh, task some people to do measurements, then they, with 100% certainty, will not follow these simple rules and come up with some other, some other ideas that will make it extremely hard to, to reanalyze um, any measurements in a couple of months or maybe even in a week after they've forgotten what they actually did. And these uh, three principles actually come from, from, um, from Hadley Wickham, I don't know if you've heard of him, so he's, he's running a, a company on reproducible data analysis centered around the R ecosystems, ecosystem, and um, that's if you want uh, your data to be reproducible, then for each, then store them in a way such that each variable that you observe, each observation that you make forms a column. So that is the CPU that the measurement has been running on forms a column, the timestamp forms a column, latency forms a column, and so on. Each observation, so each measurement value that you take forms a row, and each type of observational unit forms a table. So that can either be a table in a database, it can be a file, or it can be an, something that is called an entity in a format called HDF5. Um, has anyone already heard of HDF5 before? Uh, we did that on purpose so that you learn about HDF5. Or say, I don't have time to learn it, I gotta go run something else. Probably that <laughs> may also be a reason, yeah. No, so that, that's, that's a format actually that has been, that has been uh, around for uh, since 1987. Uh, and it comes from, from an American initiative called H-E-H-A-E-H-O-O. To build a format that does AEHOO, the all encompassing hierarchical object oriented format. It, um, yeah, it's from, uh, it uh, has origins in big data, but it was designed for precisely the purpose of recording data reproducibly because it does not just allow you to store data sets in the way that I've described in this um, reproducible format, but you can also store additional things like kernel configuration, like microcode files. Um, like explanatory texts and so on. So, so you have one package and that package contains everything. You file away the HDF5 file and then you have all to uh, reproduce your analysis in months, in years, um, in decades. It embeds structures in a single file and uh, even if it's not well known in the Linux kernel community, uh, it's very well known in the data analytics community, so it, it's supported by R, it's supported by Octave, by Python, by Mathematica, by Julia, so basically by everything you can think of that does, um, that does numerical operations. And of course, uh, if that doesn't convince you that HDF5 is a reasonable choice and worth installing a dependency or two on your system, then uh, observe that it was it's supported natively in the Mosaic browser. So the uh, fathers of the World Wide Web found the format to be so important to directly include browser support. I don't think it's supported in Firefox these days anymore, but well, the web has changed. So how do we, how do we organize our measurements? Uh, best practices that we use are we use identical file names for each measurement that simplifies some of the post-processing. Again, that's just a detail, but if you have, if you need to change uh, file names every time you run an analysis, um, that makes things hard to automate. 
Uh, active parameters, so parameters that we can and do set during an analysis, for instance, the amount of load that we produce or the type of load that we produce, we encode in directories. Um, and any derived parameters, like the kernel version that we're using, so parameters that we cannot set actively uh, during different measurement runs are stored in files. That's uh, just a suggestion, but that is something that has turned out to work very well in practice. Uh, so we've been, we've been now doing systematic analysis of latencies for a year or a year and a half, and that is the thing that uh, we've converged to. Reproducibility, I may have already stressed a number of times uh, before, is a very, very important thing. And that uh, implies that you are also not just supposed to save the parameters that you've set, active and passive, but also any microcode binaries that you've been using. For instance, if you're doing uh, comparative measurements for um, different um, mitigations against spectre meltdown and so on, CPU attacks, uh, it's extremely important to keep the microcode binaries that you use to produce a given sample, say, because they tend to disappear from vendors' websites, uh, they tend to be moved around, file names tend to change, and that's a recipe for not being able to reproduce any measurements. Include non-upstream patches um, and whatnot. As I said, HDF5 makes this really easy to just attach files of these types to the measurements and then if you need them or not, you have them around. Okay, but that's more the uh, mechanics of what we're doing and the mechanics of um, um, how we work. Let me come to the, to the analysis proper. I think I have until three o'clock, so I'm going to skip the uh, first part here, which is basically about how to properly visualize, how to properly visualize uh, any measurement results. I'm giving some cookbook recipes for plotting these in the slides, and you can uh, look at them after the talk. Because the, the thing uh, that's more important is after you've taken, say, you've all seen, you've all seen measurements of, say, that kind where you record, say, this is a system with 10 CPUs, you record the typical latency diagrams. You see, okay, you ha I have so and so many uh, hits with that latency, so and so many with that latency, and so on. And for each CPU, you do observe a maximum latency. The typical course of action now would be to find the highest value for the, for the latency and say, okay, that's the worst case that can happen in my system. Um, which is okay, a, which is an approach you can do, but uh, which is an approach that is not very reassuring because uh, it doesn't make any difference. So the number, you will have a number, but the number doesn't include any information about how long did you measure, how certain is that number, what's the amount of uncertainty in the number, and so on. And that's, of, uh, that's a situation that we've, uh, or that was a problem that uh, we encountered when we um, showed systems of that kind to certification authorities because they ask precisely these questions. How trustworthy are these numbers? So how can you make sure that you've really captured all the uh, bad events, the bad data points that could lead to larger? Uh, to larger latencies. Problem with such measurement-based approaches is the interesting events are all in the tails of the distribution. So the, uh, the, the interesting events in the sense of high latencies are very rare events. So that means um, determining, determining them properly is a, a complicated statistical problem. Uh, as I said, the typical, typical statement that people make is the highest threshold we've seen is X, Y, Z, so in so many microseconds, and then you can trust them or not. What's better is if you say, okay, after so and so many hours of measuring, the highest threshold we've seen is um, so and so high, because then if you say, okay, we've measured for 10 minutes, and we've seen a threshold of uh, 50 microseconds, then this is, of course, less trustworthy than if you say we've measured for seven days and seen a, the same threshold of 50 microseconds. You can to try to improve that in uh, various ways. That's the portion I can adapt to the audience. So you can say, okay, after seven hours of measuring, we've seen 50 microseconds of latency while Stephen Rostad was standing in front of the system, making sure that everything goes fine. That may increase um, social credibility of the results, but it doesn't I'm sorry to say that, uh, doesn't increase credibility statistically. 
because ideally what we, uh, but that's actually, that's actually how, uh, how people try to argue because if, uh, if you tell them, okay, I'm not sure if your measurement is really correct and they say, oh, but Thomas Kleixner did that measurement so it must be correct. But that of course is not what we'd like to have. What we would like to have is a statement like at a given confidence level, the probability to exceed this and that threshold is so and so high because you cannot make absolute statements anyway. Now, how do we, how do we achieve that? Um, we do that by switching from a simple measure and then um, seek the maximum approach to a two-stage approach. We measure, we collect data that characterizes the system, and uh, then, sorry, we switch from a, a two-stage approach, measure, and then determine the maximum to a three-stage approach, we measure. Then we try to come up with a model that describes the system well. The model, of course, should be based on solid statistical considerations, and then we infer estimates of the worst case execution time plus um, associated uncertainties from this model. How do we come up with such a model? So ideally, we'd like to have, we'd like, to, we'd like the model to satisfy three, um, three criteria. One is generality, so it should apply not to just one situation, but it should apply to multiple real world situations. So we should not just be able to use it, say, in the automotive context, but also in healthcare and in, in other contexts. It should, uh, it should be precise, so the results that we obtain from the model should, of course, um, differ a little from what's actually seen uh, on real-world systems, and the models, as such, should be real. They should accurately represent real-world phenomena, so they should describe the systems that we are looking at well. Satisfying all these three conditions simultaneously turns out to be impossible for uh, statistical reasons that I'm happy to discuss after the talk. That's going to lead very, very deeply into um, uh, statistics. Turns out we need, to, we need to drop one of these criteria and the criterion that is actually the best one to drop is realism. So we don't benefit much from the model being too close to the actual system. Uh, it suffices if the model has the same properties as the system, but it does not necessarily be in a one-to-one -one connection with, say, how the system is composed of functional units and so on, as long as the results are the same. If you um, focus on generality and precision, then you can come, can come up with uh, proper models. Now, how does the model look like that we use? Basically, if you look at uh, what a latency measurement tells you from a statistical point of view, it's, uh, a latency is a random variable. So do, you don't know the value you're measuring. You know that the value is within some range. You know that the value has some distribution, but you cannot tell on a shot-by-shot -shot basis what the actual measurement will look like. And effectively, you are sampling a number of observations, x1, blah, 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 up to xn from this random variable x. Now, the good thing is that random variable does not mean that it has random or unspecified properties. You all know, for instance, um, the statistical statement that if you measure a random variable, random variable, whatever the distribution is, say, for instance, if you measure uh, the... Uh, outcomes of throwing a die, throwing dice. Then you get um, result one with uh, probability one over six, result two with probability one over six, and so on. You don't know which uh, value you get, but um, you know the probability distribution. And now this random variable has some, some properties. For instance, if you add up, if you sum up two dice, three dice, four dice, five dice, and so on, you know that uh, the, that the sum, um, the sum will converge regardless of what the distribution is here, will converge to some Gaussian distribution regardless of the um, properties of the original random variable. Now the sum of latencies is of course something that's not very interesting to us. What is very interesting for us is the maximum latency from a given measurement or from 10 given measurements or from a block of 50 measurements. And it turns out that um, there is a, a very interesting statistical statement that connects the maxima, the block maxima of 
random variable measurements. And that is the so-called generalized extreme value distribution. I'm not going uh, to get into this formula in detail. The meaning behind this formula is if you take a number of measurements, say a block of five minutes of latency measurements, then five more minutes of latency measurements, then five more minutes of latency measurements, and you compute the maximum for each of these blocks, then the maxima need, um, need to behave in a way that uh, satisfies this so-called generalized extreme value distribution, meaning that you can find this distribution is governed by three parameters, that you can use a maximum likelihood estimation to find the three parameters that best satisfy the given measurement values. And then from this shape of the distribution, you can then infer uh, not just the expected maximum value that we'll ever encounter, but also a range um, of values that at the given significance level, the maximum value is supposed to drop into. And uh, that's, that's exactly what we wanted. That is not just the worst case execution time estimate as such, but it also includes a, um, a, a quantification of the uncertainty for the measurement. Now we're seeing uh, the things that we expect to see when we do measure for longer times, then the uncertainty gets smaller. Uh, we, we can quantify how large uncertainty is and so on. That's already a first step uh, towards satisfying these um, certification criteria that I mentioned up front. Uh, of course, this may sound quite, say, miraculously. And to some extent, it also is because uh, the method relies on two properties, two properties, two statistical properties that are not fully satisfied by systems at the moment. So that one is the um, assumption that all the measurement values that we take uh, are from an uh, IID distribution. And um, they're also from a continuous distribution. Both of these criteria are not satisfied. So we are still making some mistakes. Uh, we've made sure that we err on, err on the side of, um, of caution, so our estimates are usually, are, um, we can show that our estimates are too large, not too small. That's already a good thing, but of course not optimal. But there is still some, um, some work required to basically address these two issues. Good, and that is basically all I wanted to tell you about Jitter Debugger and uh, how we proceeded with statistical analysis. I guess there's a minute or so left for questions. If you have any, if not, thank you for your attention.